to um, to help us with this. So I wanted to, as usual, start with a meditation for about half an hour or so, and then I'll give a little reflection, um, bringing some of the Buddha's teachings in, some of his methods and approaches that can help us, and then we'll open up for some discussion, and uh, perhaps you can also share any tips or ways that you find work or perhaps things that don't work, things that fuel the fires of hate and irritation. <laughs> Hopefully not too much hatred, that's a really strong word, but of course, you know, sometimes we have this and it's not necessarily towards others. It can equally be towards ourselves. right? I think this is sometimes overlooked, um, but also it can be very toxic and undermining of our best intentions. So we'll start with a meditation and uh, I'm going to suggest during this meditation that we bring up, if you're ready and if you feel comfortable, um, a time that you felt irritated recently and just get in touch with how that felt. So please only do that if it feels, you know, comfortable enough to and don't bring up anything really major, <laughs> just some little irritation or a sense of frustration or, you know, maybe how you felt when you read a certain piece of news or something like that. But we'll contain you with metta. So we'll do the padding of metta first of all to hold that and then um, and that'll be the invitation. But with any of these uh, meditations, they're just invitations. They're not uh, prescriptive in any way. So if that's not working for you, please just default back to your preferred method or to whatever feels appropriate in this evening session, because we all need different things at different times. Yeah, It's like not everybody wants to eat the same meal. We all have different tummies, different digestion, different rates of digestion. So not one meal for all. So, oh, and if you're brave enough, we might also, and if I don't talk too long, <laughs> we might also have some little groups as well to um, just to share with each other sort of in groups of three or four. So we'll see how that goes. And I invite you to just settle back into your seat. The folks at Guy House look very comfy, <laughs> professionals. And yeah, I also usually fidget a bit I realize I've got the leg of the chair poking into my feet. So I consider this part of the meditation, really taking that care, that time to tend to the body, give it as much space as it needs, as much comfort, as much support. And maybe even Gently rolling your shoulders or stretching your back a bit. If you've been working on computers, I can find my neck's either slightly forward or my shoulders are hunched or sometimes you can even have this tendency to put your head more over to one side than the other. So you might wanna just stretch either side of your neck. and allowing yourself some deep breaths. As though with the in-breath, you're bringing nourishment into the body intentionally, intentionally caring for yourself. And on the out-breath, breathing out with a sense of relaxation, letting things go. Allowing the breath to nourish and release. You may even want to sigh some tension out of the body. <sighs> See if that can help your body drop down that bit more into the floor, into your cushion or your chair. And establishing your mindfulness. We're going to imbue that mindfulness with kindness as well. 
so that there's a sense of alertness, presence, which is also soft and friendly, welcoming. Ready to receive whatever comes to mind. So just spreading this loving awareness through your body, perhaps from the top of the head as though you're putting a drop of ink in a glass of water and it's gently moving down and through that water, coloring every particle. So also your awareness imbued with kindness colors every part of your body. Relaxing, soothing, calming each part. Noticing as that awareness whirls around each part of your body, any sensations that you experience there. And see if you can have an open heart, an attitude of love and kindness, whether they're pleasant, neutral, or perhaps disagreeable. And notice how that kindness tends to calm things down. And how those sensations in the body bring you that little bit closer into this present moment. helping you arrive in your body and in your mind. And I'd like to now, if you wish, invite you to just tune in to any sensations which feel comfortable, easeful, pleasant, or maybe just neutral.
and staying connected to those. Gently start to wish yourself well. As though you were looking at yourself the way someone who loves you very dearly would look at you. Or perhaps the way someone who respects and sees your goodness would regard you. with kindly, loving eyes. And in the same way that a dear friend or benefactor, perhaps parent, sibling or partner would wish well for you, See if you can offer yourself thoughts of loving kindness, which capture your highest welfare. And gently repeat those words to yourself. So for example, I usually say, may I be happy. May I be free. May I be healed. May I be at peace. So just choosing maybe two, three or four phrases that capture what you most wish for yourself. And imagine planting each phrase in your own heart like a beautiful seed. And in the gap between each phrase Allowing your loving awareness to nurture that seed. Trusting that it will bring forth a little shoot, even a flower, in its own time. Just sensing into the resonance of those beautiful wishes of loving kindness. Repeating them again and again.
If at any time the effort feels tiring or too much, just gently relax the words or perhaps put more space in between. Just trusting the power of these intentions to bring about the results of loving kindness in their own time without looking for anything special. Just content to give yourself these gifts. And if you feel this could be helpful, if you feel fairly settled, fairly peaceful, I'd like to invite you to remember a time, perhaps fairly recently, when you felt irritated or angered. anything or anyone. Without going into details about what happened or why, see if you can recollect, notice how that anger, resentment or frustration felt. See if you can hold that in this field of loving kindness, continuing to wish yourself well, recognizing that anger hurts you first of all. And that you are in need of your loving care at that time. You may find you can continue with the phrases of loving kindness. Or if you feel connected to that suffering, a sense of pain or hurt, you might find that loving kindness gently moves towards compassion. slightly different emotional tone. You may wish to adapt the phrases of loving kindness to may I be free from suffering. Or 
or may I be kind to, to, to my anger or pain? Perhaps imagining how that dear friend or benefactor would look at you with kindness, without judgment, even when you are suffering or in pain. And now if you feel ready, if your heart is fairly tender, open, resourced, I'd like to invite you to think of another person, perhaps somebody who seems angry or upset. perhaps behaves in unskillful ways. And recognizing that they too suffer when they're angry or resentful or impatient. See if you can offer them some thoughts of loving kindness or compassion. May you be happy. May you be free from suffering.
Even if it's hard to feel a sense of genuine care, just recognizing that these good wishes are already helping to bring your thinking on the right track. To acknowledge that all beings wish to be happy, don't wish to suffer. So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. Gently allow this person's image or presence to fade. Perhaps thanking them for being part of your practice. And gently connecting again with your own body. Noticing any feelings that you have now in your body and mind. Any emotions. Allowing them to be. Held in this field of loving kindness. And just ending by appreciating your own virtue, your own inner strength, the beauty of your intention to practice the Dhamma, to understand what's happening in this body and mind. See if you can really extend a feeling of gratitude and appreciation towards yourself. Perhaps even wearing a slight smile and allowing that smile to suffuse your entire body and mind. Bringing gladness, encouragement, and celebrating the goodness of your life. So when you're ready and you have 
at least a little bit of a smile. <laughs> I invite you to open your eyes to end this meditation session. If you wish, you can continue to meditate while we talk. It's up to you. <laughs> Good, I don't see too many scowls. <laughs> Even if you're scowling, that's okay. <laughs> I'm not allowed to scowl because I'm teaching, but it's really difficult to scowl when I see a room full of such lovely people. <laughs> yeah. I'm still a bit of a novelty element as well to this whole Zoom group thing. It's uh, really incredible that we can share the Dhamma in this way. Really incredible. And it works apparently. <laughs> people do get benefits so, yeah. I certainly do so I wanted to talk about overcoming resentment today uh, not that I presume it's necessarily a big issue for anybody here in particular but I guess because it is you know one of the hindrances it's hindrance number one uh, my teacher Ajahn Brahm calls them public enemy number one or it might be Ajahn Brahmani Anyway, ill will is obviously a source of suffering, you know, and as such, it's a very problematic uh, hindrance of the mind, not only because, it, you know, we develop animosity and resentment towards others, which damages our relationships, but also because of the toxic effect that it has on our own mind. It's almost impossible. In fact, I'd say it is impossible to be angry and happy at the same time. You know, it's, it's very obviously a coarse form of suffering that makes us miserable and makes others around us very miserable too. And so we do need to start to understand how we um, can develop resentment and, and how it can fester if we're not very careful um, and learn how to use our minds in ways that helps us to undermine that tendency, helps us to overcome um, the tendency of irritation, frustration when things don't go our way. Um, and in the suttas, the Buddha likens a mind with anger to um, water that's boiling. So he has all these lovely similes of water for the different five hindrances. I think the sensual desire is the uh, water that's colored with different uh, dyes. Um, what else is there? Like uh, sleepiness is the one that's covered with kind of algae, um, or that might be doubt, I'm not sure. It's murky anyway, and you can't really see clearly. So all of these things are basically obscuring the mind's potential to be able to see things as they are. Because if the water's boiling and constantly being churned up, it can't reflect reality in an accurate way. You know, in the way that a lake can reflect accurately if it's very very still you know you can see the trees you can see the mountains reflected in that lake almost perfectly or you can see right to the depth of that lake to all the pebbles and stones lying at the bottom but if the water is actually so hot that it's boiling then you know you can't see very much at all and unfortunately it's often when we're in an angry state and make decisions that those decisions go badly wrong you know and we end up really regretting our choices simply because we weren't able to see um, but the good news with this is um, that apparently, according to one of my teachers, he says that this is uh, probably the easiest one to overcome. And I probably say that's true, judging by from my own experience, um, because craving, wanting is so um, pervasive in the mind, you know, it's there from the moment we wake up in the morning, right? It's the first thing that comes is this desire to to uh, eat or to, um, to enjoy life. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying, but it's something that drives our existence. So it's very deep and very subtle. 
obviously at the coarser level, it's things like sensual desire that then would turn into breakages of our sila. So that can be, of course, equally as problematic as ill will. But generally speaking, the ill will is, in a sense, I wouldn't necessarily say more superficial, but easier to overcome or at least reduce quite significantly by practicing in certain ways. So that's the good news. And um, I was thinking that, you know, the anger and resentment is quite a topical theme at the moment because obviously there's great political divide in the world. You know, the elections in America, which were pretty good, much a landslide victory for um, Joe Biden, but also, you know, it wasn't so far apart. So, you know, it's almost as though our countries, like whether America or, or England, I don't know about other countries in Europe or elsewhere in the world, but it's as though our, um, our nations are almost split down the middle, you know, 50-50 voted for Brexit, 50-50, 50% voted to stay in the EU. And it's so easy when we can see these almost opposite views to start to stigmatize the other side and say, well, the other side are the baddies, you know, we're right and they're wrong. And how can they have thought like that? How can they have voted like that? And we start to lose this sense that we're all human beings simply doing our best. And also that, you know, just because other people have different political choices or um, sometimes they're not even choices, they've just been very much influenced by the media who may be more or less reputable. Um, and, and that means that we can't see any good in those people, right? Just because they have different choices from us without remembering that if we'd have had similar imports, similar conditioning, similar education or upbringing, how do we know that we wouldn't too see things that way? How can we be so certain that we'd be so different, right? Or that we wouldn't be like we are. So we're always very biased and it's so easy if we're not careful for these differences to sort of create more and more rifts between people and then our countries, our political systems, our people can never really heal. So instead of moving you know, into more hatred and division, we need to um, think about how we can bring some brightness and, and move towards love, towards unity, towards harmony in our societies and also in our minds, right? Because it all starts within our minds. So even in the Dhammapada, the Buddha says um, in a very famous quote, you know, that hatred is never overcome by hatred, but by love alone is hatred overcome. And I think Martin Luther King said something very, very similar, you know, because this is the wisdom that is not so hard to come to, right? When we fuel the fires of anger by retaliating, then we're just creating more and more of a problem. We're getting ourselves into some really difficult areas. So, yeah, I was listening to a talk by Ajahn Brown, my teacher, uh, a few weeks ago, and he said something really nice. He said that the best way this is paraphrasing him as best I remember, the best way to um, defeat a harmful ideology is not to argue and not to uh, fight it, but to present a better one, a more beautiful one, yeah? And in a sense, one that can supplant the ideologies that cause more harm. And isn't that just a beautiful way to look at life? You know, instead of arguing, we just try to rise towards something nobler and present that, encourage that in others. So we don't have to say other people are wrong, but we can say, well, this is the way I choose to live and be that good example, be the change you want to see in the world, right? So, but it's difficult to do this when we feel that, you know, our anger is justified in some way. And of course, many times when I talk about anger, people invariably ask, well, isn't some kind of anger good because it can motivate us to make a change? You know, isn't righteous anger good? because we know we're on the side of ethics. But the thing with anger is that it always tires the mind. And as I say, it's very hard to make um, clear and effective decisions when the mind is like that boiling water. We can't see clearly what we want to do. So sure, you know, um, speaking up against injustice, feeling um, hurt, even feeling angry by the horrible, you know, racism that we see in the world, has its place initially, but I would say it, the skillful way to deal with that is to go back into your own uh, private space and reflect carefully on anger, on the benefit, oh, sorry, not the benefits, on the harm of anger 
Yeah, and of the beauty of loving kindness, the beauty of understanding, of harmony, and try to overcome those negativities first. Because once you do that, you'll still hold the same values, but your mind will be energized and balanced enough to take steps and to take the right steps to overcome these things. So it's not that we don't act unless we're angry. We act out of love. We act out of compassion. And these are much more powerful, stronger forces that are much more sustaining as well. So without further ado, I did want to talk about the five ways in the suttas that the Buddha talks about how to overcome anger and resentment. And there's uh, two different sets of five ways. But I wanted to go with the first one uh, in the beginning. And I think that's, let's have a look, that is from the Anguttaras. It's Anguttara Nikaya 5161 for anybody who wants to check these suttas out. And this is from a beautiful book by Bhikkhu Bodhi called Social and Communal Harmony. Um, and it's a very lovely little collection of all kinds of different themes. So this one is specifically about dealing with anger. So I'll just read through it and then go into each one in a little bit more detail. So here, the, the Buddha is addressing the monks, but I tend to think that this is a little bit gender biased because there were undoubtedly uh, nuns there as well, I'm sure, somewhere, or he may have given this to nuns later on. And also this equally applies to all lay people too. So I'm gonna use the word community instead. Community, there are these five ways of removing resentment by which one should entirely remove resentment when it's arisen towards anyone. And I'd just like to add here that I equally think these can apply to, to removing resentment towards ourselves. So anyone means others, but it also means anger towards ourselves because we're really strange creatures as human beings. And you would think that we wouldn't want to harm, you know, the one that we hold dear and that we look after every day and bother to feed and wash and all the rest, but we do. <laughs> so I think they apply equally to ourselves. So what five? Number one, one should develop loving kindness for the person one resents, and in this way should remove resentment towards that person. Number two, one should develop compassion for the person one resents, and in this way remove resentment toward that person. So we practiced both of these just now in brief. Number three, one should develop equanimity toward the person one resents. And in this way, one should remove the resentment towards that person. Number four, one should disregard the person one resents and pay no attention to them. In this way, one should remove the resentment toward that person. I, I can't help but tweet up that that's sort of what Twitter did to Donald Trump, isn't it? <laughs> and then number five, one should apply the idea of ownership of karma to the person one resents. Thus, this one is the owner of their karma, the heir of their karma, has karma as their origin, karma as their relative, karma as their resort, will be the heir of any karma they do, good or bad. In this way, one should remove the resentment toward that person. So just to quickly mention about karma in this context, it doesn't mean fate. It, it simply means their actions, the actions that will then bear fruit, and in particular, the intentional action. So the quality of intention behind any act of speech or any physical action that they do. So where they're coming from, really. Okay. So this is really interesting, I find, because obviously loving kindness is number one and loving kindness is foundational to all the other Brahma Viharas. So we always try with this one, first of all. And um, it's the most powerful antidote as well to ill will. You know, it's the one that the Buddha often talks about in the suttas and um, he talks about it in the context of receiving abuse, verbal abuse, that one should um, remain with a mind of loving kindness towards the one who's abusing. Yeah, and if that doesn't work, to have compassion toward them, because, of course, they're creating their own suffering. I mean, if you've ever abused anybody or shouted at somebody, you've probably noticed that you can only do that if you're already suffering, if you're already having a bad day 
or something's gone wrong or you feel misunderstood. So there's suffering there already. And then by using that bad speech and abusing you, they're creating more suffering in the future as well. You know, it obviously um, disturbs relationships and uh, destroys harmony between people, especially when we're not able to forgive. So that forgiveness is also part of loving kindness. But the Buddha even goes further in a particular sutta called the simile of the saw. And it's rather a gruesome simile because he's talking about the um, imagined scenario of being literally sawn limb by limb with a two handled saw. So that means one of those saws with the teeth, you know, and they imagine that some bandits have got hold of you and they're like sawing off your leg or something. Pretty gruesome, right? And then he makes the statement that if one would develop e anger towards those people, even who were torturing them in such a way, they would not be practicing my teachings, he says. They would not be practicing my teachings. And sometimes if people aren't familiar with the wider context of Buddhism, they can feel that that sounds very judgmental. You know, like, how can they say that that's not practicing properly? But the Buddha is concerned with one thing, and that is suffering. Okay, two things, suffering and the end of suffering, and in particular, the end, right? So in that context, if you would have even a moment of hatred towards those people, you wouldn't be practicing the teachings in the sense that you would still be in that whole cycle of suffering. Yeah, and the Buddha wants you to end suffering completely. So even though it looks at that moment that you're the one that's suffering, actually the suffering of dying is one type of suffering, but the suffering of killing somebody else, this is something in a completely different league because they're not only creating enormous bad karma and obviously they're suffering enormously already in this life, something's gone very, very wrong. But if you do have the view or the you know mind that's open to the possibility of, of lives in the future, then they're certainly not going to get a very good rebirth. And so this suffering is going to be perpetuated for a long, 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 long time. But fear not, there are also other ways to practice loving kindness. And the Buddha says that even for one who practices loving kindness for the, for the length of time it takes to snap their fingers, another one is the, to pull the cow's udder, to milk the cow. But I think it's easier to snap our fingers, really. We don't usually have a cow available to try that one out. <laughs> Even if you develop loving kindness for that length of time, you are practicing his teachings. And he praises that more than giving alms, than giving food to hungry people, for example. And again, this is like, hmm, surely it's more of a sign of loving kindness and it has more advantage if you actually give food to a thousand people. But I think the reason that it's more important to develop loving kindness from the depth of your mind as an intention, as an inclination of the mind, is because by doing that, you're more likely to develop more and more and more loving kindness that becomes like the theme tune of your life in a way, right? It becomes the inclination and the character of your life. So it's incredibly powerful and it's going to lead to a lot more charity, a lot more um, generosity than a single offering could ever do. At least that's my interpretation. And of course, loving kindness opens our heart to all beings, right? Not only to the beings that we like, and as I said the other day, not only the beings that are like us, <laughs> right? So apparently in psychology, they, they found that we tend to empathize more naturally with people who look like us. So, of course, this can show you where the roots of things like racism can lie, like very fundamental, obvious discrimination, systemic racism, something much more pervasive and tricky to address. But, you know, we have this natural tendency, of course. I mean, that's why a mother and a child look so alike, because you see yourself in the mother's eyes and they're your first mirror, right? But with loving kindness, we can really start to expand our um, empathy and understanding to all beings simply on the grounds of them being human like ourselves, right? We all suffer, first of all. We all suffer. Even if people appear to be happy, people appear to have more than us, people appear perhaps to do all kinds of bad things and still don't seem to suffer. But we don't know that. We really don't know that. And I think I know enough about the way my mind works now that I could pretty much say with certainty 
that if you have you know negative speech or harmful behavior towards another person you are suffering and equally if you even if you live in a beautiful place and you have you know so-called everything you ever wanted around you you can still suffer if you don't know why you're here right if you don't know what the real purpose of life is what the real meaning is then you still suffer just the same because we all want freedom. We want more than just physical material comfort. And so just by being alive, we suffer. And um, yeah, so there's another simile. I'm already aware that I'm gonna talk too long <laughs> again, but uh, there's so much I'd like to share. So I'll try and go through it fairly quickly, but there's another lovely simile um, that one of my teachers, Ajahn Pramali, likes to use um about different ways to remove resentment and the first there's another five ways and the first three pertain to loving kindness and these are not just the practice of loving kindness as an emotion but ways to use the mind so it's kind of ways to start thinking and reflecting in order to undermine uh, aversion and, and resentment in our mind and i think this is very practical because thinking and reflecting on situations reframing our experience is something we can do every day, not only on the meditation cushion, but it's what we do in our private life. It's what we do when, I don't know, maybe you're lying in bed about to go to sleep and you've got some time to reflect on the day. You can learn to incline your mind in the direction of um, freedom, in the direction of your benefit rather than your harm. So a really important question to ask ourselves with anything we think or um, any way that we reflect is, is this line of thought or is this, uh, yeah, let's say line of thought in this case, is this for my benefit or is this for my harm? Yeah, just that simple question. And amazingly, once we realize something's for our harm, we tend to have a natural instinct to turn away from it. But we have to remember to ask that question. So in this particular sort of um, the Buddha's talking about people whose bodily behavior is impure, but their verbal behavior is pure, or their verbal behavior is impure. Is that the other way around? <laughs> or it's vice versa, right? So perhaps somebody could say very nice words, but do very terrible things. Or perhaps somebody, you know, speaks really unkindly to people, but they actually live quite a, a good life, you know, maybe they like to swear a lot and they get angry, but they're actually, you know, working as a nurse or as a teacher and doing a lot of good. And um, so they're the first two kind of people. And then the next one is one whose body and verbal behavior are quite impure. And then, yes, and then verbal are impure. Yeah, that's right. So in that case, they sometimes still experience peace in their mind. But then the fourth kind of person is somebody whose bodily and verbal behavior is impure and they don't experience any peace in their mind, okay? So the first three of these cases where their either verbal or bodily behavior is impure um, and sometimes they gain some peace. In each of these cases, the Buddha advises that we basically look at the positive side of that person. So what he's saying here is that we're all different, right? We all have some strengths and some weaknesses. And, and these change all the time, right? We might look at another person and think, gosh, they're always lying, this is terrible, I would never lie. And immediately you kind of place yourself as better than them. But perhaps you don't lie, but perhaps you have other um, negative qualities, like you get impatient with people or you're kind of too much of a perfectionist, too hard on yourself. And the other person is not, right? So we start to see that we can't really compare in that way and that certain things that irritate us about someone might not irritate other people about them. Or that certain things that seem to be, you know, objectionable in a person is not the whole picture, right? It's not the whole picture. So the simile that the Buddha gives is that um, if we meet such a person, he says, it's like seeing a rag by the roadside. You press down that rag with the left foot and spread it out with the right foot and then tear off the intact section and take it away. 
So too, when a person's body beha bodily behavior is impure, but their verbal behavior is pure, on that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of the bodily behavior, but should instead attend to the purity of the verbal behavior. Okay. So this shows that you're trying to look for the good in that person. You realize that they, they appear like an old rag, you know, that's been discarded somewhere, but actually part of that rag can still be used. So you take away the good part, because remember, this is not at this stage about getting a realistic picture of a person. And I don't really think we can ever do that. We can never really know another. But it is about trying to overcome your own suffering and your own anger, which really doesn't do you any good, right? So we try to look at the person in a positive light. And by doing that, we tend to encourage those good qualities in another. You know, you can reinforce that by giving praise or appreciation for another's good qualities, you know, saying, oh, I see this in you. And if you do that, that person tends to feel encouraged and you may find that they start um, exhibiting that quality more and more. So in this way, the negative ones don't always have to be drawn attention to because quite often when we do that, we just get into arguments. And so in the next simile, it's the opposite. So this is one whose bodily behavior is pure and their verbal behavior is impure. And the simile that the Buddha gives here is that there's a pond covered with algae and water plants. Someone might arrive afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. They would plunge into the pool, sweep away the algae and the water plants with their hands and drink from their cupped hands and then leave. So too, when a person's verbal behavior is impure but the bodily behavior is pure, on that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of verbal behavior, but instead attend to the purity of the bodily behavior. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. So these aren't literal um, similes. It doesn't mean that, you know, it necessarily, it doesn't necessarily imply that all of their, you know, bodily behavior is pure and all of their verbal behavior is impure. They're just examples. But again, it's saying, look at the good part, right? And in this simile, it's nice because it's saying that someone comes who's afflicted by uh, and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. So this is a simile for us when we're full of anger Right? We actually feel hot, you know, the heart rate starts to kind of go up and we might even be flushed in our face. I remember talking to a woman once and she actually did go bright red. I could see the, the colour creeping up her neck like a red flash and right into her face. It was really, I felt for her actually because I felt she was suffering. Um, so we are this person oppressed by the heat and we come to this pond and if we're just gonna kind of look at the algae and worry about the algae, we're never gonna get any water to drink. So we move it aside and then we drink and quell our thirst by, quench our thirst by, again, seeing the good in that person. And the next one is similar, but this is a person whose behavior is much more impure, the bodily and verbal. And in this case, the water is only a puddle. <laughs> so there's just this little puddle which is very murky and not very nice at all, but at the same time, you're very uh, uh, thirsty. So then you have to get down on your hands and knees and cop the water in your hand to drink it. So this means we have to pay even closer attention to that person in order to find one little thing that we can respect, anything in that person that can help us to pacify our anger, yeah? There might be public figures, for example. I'm probably giving too much away. <laughs> but anyway, there are some people it's hard to see that. But then we can say, OK, well, their family seem to care about them. You know, they might be loyal or they might be, I don't know, there might be something there, right? They don't always act in their absolute worst. They don't always, you know, put their finger on the, I don't know what, what that button is. <laughs> they didn't do that. Phew. So there are some things that we can be grateful for even there. So these are the three um, of those five examples where loving kindness is the antidote. So then compassion is the second one, right? Compassion is the next method for overcoming our resentment. And uh, compassion is given a nice example in here 
with a person who is basically very, very sick. Their body and their verbal behavior is uh, very impure and they never have any peace of mind. So their mind never um, attains what's called here an opening of mind. So their mind is basically always full of the hindrances. Yeah. And in this case, the Buddha says, we change our approach. So here it says, suppose a sick, afflicted, gravely ill person was traveling along a highway and the last village behind him and the next village ahead were both far away. They would not obtain suitable food and medicine nor a qualified attendant. They would not get to meet the leader of the village district. So this basically means they would be abandoned even though they were desperate. Another person traveling along the highway might see that person and arouse sheer compassion, sympathy and tender concern, thinking, oh, may this person obtain suitable food, suitable medicine and a qualified attendant. May they get to meet the leader of the village district. For what reason? So that this person does not encounter calamity and disaster right here. And then later it also says, so that with the breakup of the body and after death, that person will not be reborn in the plane of misery in a bad destination, in a lower world or even in hell. So whether we believe or are open to the possibility of future lives, we can certainly see that this person is living in a hell right now. Yeah, they're really thirsty, gravely ill and there's absolutely no help around. So the only thing you would think, isn't it, is, oh, my goodness, may someone come and save this person. May they get the help they need, you know, and for some people, we know they're not going to. Right. So rather than feeling angry and upset with that person, we can turn it around and, and become full of concern for them. You know, imagining if we were in a similar situation, how we might feel. So I think the compassion is a really, really powerful way to overcome resentment, especially when there isn't very much you can do or, or reflect on about this person's uh, qualities at all. And then the third one that I mentioned was the equanimity. And I think this is another really important one. Again, it's sequential. So you've tried the meta, you've tried the compassion, and nothing much can be done. So equanimity is the response of the heart, which steps back in a sense, when you've tried every other method, and you just realize there's only so much you can do. So in a sense, there is still care, but you also become realistic about, you know, how far you can really help somebody. And there's a sense of spaciousness in the mind. So, you know, we might have to actually get physical space from that person in order to reflect with equanimity on a situation. At first, we might feel quite, you know, stressed or upset after a, a, maybe an interaction with somebody. But then when you get a bit of space and you go back and reflect, you can have a bit more objectivity about the situation and even come to peace with your own inner emotional response. And when all that is settled and you can be more accepting, more equanimous and more realistic about how far you can help, then there might be a solution that arises. You might be able to write an email to that person, for example. One of my friends, Mel, she was talking to me today. She came to visit and this had happened and she'd written an email to somebody to say, you know, is there anything you'd like to talk about further to try and, you know, smooth things over? And sometimes that's as much as we can do. Yeah. And if they want to accept that invitation or not is entirely up to them. There's another really nice um, quote that my teacher says with people that we uh, have difficulties with and we've tried everything. Um, and we feel that it's better not to be too close to them. He says, you can always love the tiger from a distance. <laughs> so this is also quite nice because sometimes we need to give ourselves that space to become more balanced in ourselves, and also to be um, accepting of our own limitations. Sometimes we can't overcome our anger right away. We, we still feel resentment, but we can, you know, equally look at our qualities. Don't blame ourselves for not being perfect. And also just develop equanimity towards ourself. You know, we're still on the path. We're still practicing. We're not perfect yet. We may never be, and we may never need to be, but we're doing our best. 
So then the fourth one that was mentioned here was um, disregarding that person or paying them no attention. And sometimes people feel that's a bit harsh, like you can't just ignore a person or give up on them. But I think what this is talking about is actually having boundaries, you know, that sometimes we need some space, we need to um, just take a break from each other for a while, again, to let things settle, to let our own emotions settle, but also so that this person or this particular incident that may have happened doesn't obsess our mind. You know, we don't want to give them too much headspace, right? Too much, uh, host them too far into our lives. We do this all the time, for example, with the news, right? We just bring the news right into our living rooms and we listen to a whole great big world overview about the most terrible things happening everywhere. And sometimes that's just too much. We need a bit of distance. We need to just turn it off and look at what's right around us, you know, the good things that we have. I was joking with Mel earlier, sometimes we just need to go and hug a tree. We both hugged a tree today, a very beautiful tall pine tree. So it can also mean just diverting your attention, right? Away from that person, away from the problem and looking at something more uplifting, giving yourself a break, yeah? It could also mean, for example, not um, allowing a person to get a rise out of you. I think this would apply, especially if anybody has teenagers or maybe a parent also who knows exactly how to trigger you. You know, sometimes we just want to ignore that and pay it no attention rather than respond. So we let them do that and we just say, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, that's a kind of uh, disregarding, you know, the triggers that we're being presented with, right? And, and sometimes that's enough to de-escalate the whole situation. You know, people gen generally give up if you, for example, stop replying to their emails. Yeah. So I think a healthy sense of boundaries is really important and recognizing that we can't solve other people's problems for them. Yeah. And this is where the last one comes in. So the last one that the Buddha talks about in this um, particular list is the um, recognizing that we're all heir to our karma. So I'll just read that one out again because it's very powerful if I can find it. So it's in dealing with anger. So this is the one where we apply the idea of ownership of karma to the person that one resents. This person is the owner of their karma, the heir of their karma, has karma as their origin, karma as their relative, karma as their resort, and will be the heir of any karma they do, good or bad. In this way, one should remove the resentment toward that person. And I think it's equally important to say here that the same holds true for us, right? So somebody can appear to hurt us, but if we are the owner of our karma, we have a choice as to how we respond or whether we respond. So we can still make good karma with whatever arises in our lives. We can still make sure we're on a good path. We practice forgiving. We practice listening to another person's perspective. We practice loving kindness and compassion. We take the distance when we need to. And we just keep on trying to align our lives with the most noble intentions that we know. You know, the intentions of loving kindness, of non-cruelty and of letting go, right? Letting go is like forgiving. Forgiving ourselves, forgiving others for not being perfect. And realizing again that, you know, we're all a product of our conditioning, all of us. We're not only a product of our conditioning, we're actually just a process. We are just conditioning in a sense. <laughs> There's no part of us that is not conditioned, right? So we're just this kind of massive conditioned phenomena. And uh, if someone else had been brought up the way we had, they may very well have similar views, but people have been brought up in all kinds of different ways. They may have gone through tragedies or traumas that we have no idea about. And that may be why they respond to things the way they do. And I mean, earlier I said, we can't be certain that we wouldn't have the same views if we were brought up just like them. But I actually think that we can be quite certain that we probably would have the same views because we are simply a product of everything we've heard, we've thought, we've read, the people that we've met, you know. There may be some things that we bring from previous lives, some certain inclinations, but still, you know, whether our goodness comes to fulfillment or, or our lives go from 
I don't know, brightness to darkness or darkness to darkness. It really depends on how we respond to whatever's in front of us now. So reflecting on karma is very, very helpful. And realizing, of course, that we don't just say, well, it's your karma, tough luck. We help people to make good karma. We teach about good karma. We try to be good examples to other people. But ultimately, we can't be responsible for their happiness or their suffering. It's impossible. It's hard enough to be responsible for our own, right? Isn't it? But we can work on that. We can work on becoming architects of our own happiness, my new favorite phrase, <laughs> and, uh, and keep on putting those causes in place. So, oh, one more thing to mention, because I did refer to that other sutta with all those examples of the, uh, the person that's part good, part negative, um, and how we can use compassion, and then the person that's really, really suffering, sorry, how we can use metta, and then the person that's really suffering, how can we use compassion? But the last of the examples given here is actually somebody whose body and mind are very pure, their verbal and bodily behavior are very pure, and they often obtain this beautiful opening of mind. And this is really nice because in this simile, it says that somebody arrives oppressed by heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. So this is like me when I go to my teacher kind of upset about something. Oh, Ajahn, you didn't listen to me last week. Or, <laughs> or oh, it's too hard doing this project. If I was a monk, I'd be living in Perth in your monastery, you know, this kind of thing. So sometimes I approach him in this way. But I'm coming to a beautiful, beautiful pool. So it says here, it's like you have plunged into a pond and you bathe and drink, and then after coming out, sit or lie down in the shade of a tree right there. So isn't this lovely? You come up to this kind of person, and they soothe you, they calm you, they offer such loving kindness, they offer the shade of a tree, the shade of wisdom and compassion, the shade of perspective and equanimity. And in that sense, we can come out of any ill will or resentment very quickly. And I think this points to the beauty of having wise friends, of associating with the virtuous and the good, and how that can be a really, really powerful way to overcome our own um, hindrances. I don't like the word defilement, but certainly how to overcome our own uh, anger or anything that stands in the way of us and the path. You know, us and the real, um, the path that we really want to be walking on to our higher good. So having wise friends, I think, is very important. And also rejoicing in another person's goodness, mudita. Yeah, I was teaching on mudita the other day for a day retreat and uh, just seeing the happiness and the joy that such beings have and learning to delight in that and to make that happiness our own. Yeah, we can feel happy for them. So there are all these different ways. And I hope in there, there was something of use. Uh, these subjects are always really big <laughs> and I sort of feel like, oh, I'll probably get through that in 15 minutes. But then after 40 minutes, I've still only touched the surface, but hopefully in there is something of help. <laughs> so that's enough for me. And uh, I'd like to kind of ask people actually whether they'd like to ask questions or go into a little um, discussion group because sometimes it's enough to hear one person give their perspective and it might be nice to hear each other instead. Any thoughts? Maybe since most of you have your videos on, could you put your hands up if you'd like to do some little groups? Oh dear, only one. <laughs> <laughs> two. <laughs> oh, I wish I could put in a little group together, but there's only two of you. So I guess <laughs> we might do that another time. Yeah. So I would instead then like to ask if there are any comments that people might have um, or anything they'd like to share about what's worked or what hasn't worked for them or any questions. And just to say that um, we'll be recording this, but we won't be recording your face. We'll only be recording your voice. The video will be pinned to me. But if you would rather your voice not be recorded, you can write your question in the box. That's absolutely fine. I know Emily had something, so I'm not sure if you feel comfortable to unmute. I think Mel can unmute if you are comfortable.
Ah, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say something, but I, I noticed that um, Jonathan had a question and he wrote that before me. So I don't know if Jonathan wants to uh, actually no, say no, something. Go ahead. No, you, you'll both get in. Go ahead. OK. You're <laughs> No, um, um, I was just thinking about um, resentment. You were talking about resentment earlier. And I think maybe so when you've practiced for, you know, a long time, you actually manage to feel anger um, when it's just coming, you know, and not actually yeah, experience yeah. it totally. And you're able to react to it, you know, quite, um, quite early in, in the process. Um, but well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel that for most people, um for, for, for most of us it's you know it's a bit more difficult than than that and we actually feel that anger um and i just i just feel that it's important to focus also on on the fact that that's okay and 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 you know what to do with that before you can actually deal with you know um yeah. the rest <laughs> yeah because um, otherwise it, it feels a bit um it feels a bit um impossible really and and it's like well you know it kind of questions how good a person you are if you can you know if you're not able to do that that easily yes. um so i just thought that that was worth um thinking about <laughs> yeah definitely thanks for bringing that up because that okay. was another big aspect of um looking at the five methods that i couldn't really get to in depth but to apply these five methods to ourselves right so one of those methods that we apply to ourselves when we feel anger is compassion. It's compassion, it's not judgment. None of these methods say judge yourself, you're a terrible practitioner, you're a terrible person. They say have loving kindness to yourself, first of all. Secondly, have compassion. It's not only compassion to the other, it's compassion to you. Compassion to the anger itself, right? Oh, anger, I hear you, there you are. It's okay, anger, you know, you're welcome, it's okay. <laughs> like, what do you need, anger? Do you need some care? Do you need some kindness? Uh, do you need to go and hug a tree? <laughs> you know, actually caring for yourself and not um, judging yourself in that way. And also the last one, well, not so much the comma, the equanimity, the equanimity can also be applied to oneself, right? whether to the actual experience of anger, like noticing it coming and just seeing it like any other phenomena. You know, it's, it's a phenomena. It manifests at the physical or mental, emotional level and just noticing that it is arising and passing away. Like everything else, there's no need to worry too much about that because it comes due to causes and it passes away when those causes cease. Or you can have equanimity towards yourself in terms of where you're at in the path, yeah? So it's okay, it's okay to sometimes feel happy, sometimes feel full of loving kindness and also sometimes feel irritable. I'm equanimous with that, I'm cool with that. I accept myself where I am. And I accept that, you know, I'm just practicing, I'm just learning, so, so it's very natural. And everyone experiences anger, quite right, everyone, yeah. So we should never, you know, judge or stigmatize ourselves. But I think it is, uh, uh, a strong tendency in most people and perhaps even more so in Dhamma practitioners that we obviously have noble aspirations and so we do tend to you know expect the best of ourselves and the shadow side of that is being too hard on ourselves when we don't meet our own expectations so, yeah yeah thank you for saying that it's really thank wonderful. you thank you very much that was really uh, really great good So um, I think Jonathan didn't have a question. He was just saying he wanted, he'd like to have the groups or wouldn't like to have the groups. Yeah. If you haven't got them. <laughs> I think I should have a session one day that's just like group session and everyone who likes the groups comes. I can see uh, Ashley has her hand up. Can we? Okay, so I can, uh, can you hear me? Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'm quite interested in this equanimity thing. Um, I don't know if it's over intellectualized, but um, a way of me trying to lessen my sort of resentment, um, for example, it could be, oh, well, sort of, I don't know, at the moment, more people were, 
you know, having, I don't know, social interactions than I am. I then say to myself, well, maybe um, it wasn't that great. Um, you know, we kind of elevate these sort of things that are going to, like material things, like they're going to bring us joy. So I, I'm kind of like telling myself things like that to reduce my resentment that actually it's okay to, you know, kind of, I can care for myself. I, I, it's like, I don't need somebody else to sort of give that affirmation. I can affirm myself. Yeah. Is that a bit over-intellectualized? I mean, I, or is that kind of what equanimity would be? Um, I think that's definitely a good starting point. And um, it's like with all these qualities, they start in a discursive way by using our mind, learning to use our mind and, and use our thought in ways that are skillful. And that's a really important part of the path because it's too common for meditators to think that the practice on the cushion is the real practice and the rest is only superficial. But actually what you're talking about is part of right effort, which is one of the factors of Sama Samadhi the um, third from the end of the Eightfold Path, right? The last three. So that right effort is a really important way of, I think of it as like tidying up the mind before actually going to sit. So you work with the coarse stuff in your daily life. You don't allow the hindrances to kind of overcome you. You deal with them there and then when they arise. And so that when you go to your meditation cushion, you don't have all this like unresolved stuff to have to unpack on the cushion and waste half your meditation sit. So I actually think it's great. And um, the more you can do that, the more it will actually start to incline the mind to the experience of equanimity as well. Um, so the general guideline for whether it's really in line with the Dhamma is, does this lead to more peace? Does this lead to more harmony, more happiness in my life? You know, are my wholesome qualities developing and my unwholesome qualities diminishing? This is the yardstick. So if that's the case, then it doesn't matter whether it seems intellectual or not, you're coming out of suffering. And um, yeah, I think the experience does just become more internalized, more embodied as the path unfolds. So, yeah, thanks for the question. Good, I'm not sure if there's a question in the box. I'll just check. We are pretty much... Uh, at 8.30 now. So Mel's just put a little link in if anybody wants to offer dana. I probably won't. Normally Mel would give a little dana talk on my own sessions, but um, I think we're pretty much out of time and you all get the email from Oxford Insight anyway. So we can skip that. And, uh, and I, I guess I can take one more question if anybody's really keen. Just a quick one, if you wish. <laughs> Jake's smiling. Has your friend got a question that you would like to ask on her behalf? No. <laughs> all right. So all resentment is resolved. We're all perfect. <laughs> By the way, when I talk about perfect, I, I actually almost never use that word because I don't believe this path is about that. I actually... You know, there's no such thing as being perfect or a perfect person. It's actually just about understanding uh, what we are, right? It's just about understanding. It's not about becoming someone else or something better. It's just understanding how this whole sense of self is fabricated, right? And moving, like I say, towards the freedom from suffering. So that's the whole point. Very good. So it's been lovely. The time flew and uh, I guess I'll see you in a month or so for Oxford Insight anyway. Yeah, actually in March because next month I'm on retreat so I'm having a little uh, uh, home retreat. I think we normally unmute you even so you can say a few words at the Oxford Insight so shall we do that without um,